Professor Dave and Chegg here. When we talk about chemical reactions, we are talking about the rearrangement of atoms. Chemical bonds break and form to generate new substances, but the identity of each atom remains intact. However, there are reactions that do alter the identity of an atom. This is because changes are occurring within the nucleus of an atom, which produce one or more nuclides that are different from the reacting nuclides. These are referred to as nuclear reactions. Let's learn about these now. As we just said, nuclear reactions can alter the identity of an atom. This is because the identity of the atom is determined by the number of positively charged protons in the nucleus. So if the number of protons inside an atomic nucleus changes, the identity of that atom will change. Neutrons are of neutral charge. So although only the protons will determine the atomic number of an atom, the protons and neutrons, collectively referred to as nucleons, both contribute to the mass number of an atom, which is equal to the number of nucleons in the nucleus, and is expressed in atomic mass units. We will want to be able to refer to atoms by using nuclide symbols, like this, which show the atomic number, mass number, and charge if applicable. Let's also recall that atomic nuclei are extremely dense, much more dense than bulk matter, since the atoms that make up most of what we can see are predominantly empty space, while inside a nucleus, the nucleons are packed very tightly together. While the electromagnetic force dictates that the positively charged protons will be repelling each other, since like charges repel, it is the much stronger and aptly named strong nuclear force that attracts and binds all nucleons and makes the nucleus stable. However, some nuclei will be unstable. This can occur for various reasons, so this begs the underlying question, what is it that dictates nuclear stability? The first thing we want to look at in order to answer this question is examine the neutron to proton ratio for all of the stable isotopes that we know of. That's what this chart shows, with the number of neutrons on the vertical axis, the number of protons on the horizontal axis, and every stable isotope we know, like carbon-12 or oxygen-16, is represented by a dot on the chart. If this black line with a slope of 1 represents a precise 1 to 1 ratio of neutrons to protons, then we will define this region here as the band of stability, because it is a roughly linear region that contains all of the stable isotopes. It also reveals a firm preference exhibited by nature to use nuclei that at very low mass show roughly a 1 to 1 ratio, like nitrogen-14 with 7 protons and 7 neutrons. But as the nucleus gets larger, the ratio shifts closer to 1.5 to 1. This is because as more and more protons are added to the nucleus, the repulsion between them gets greater and greater, so more neutrons, which are of neutral charge, are needed to diffuse some of that repulsion. In addition to this preferred ratio, we can see that nature prefers to have both protons and neutrons present in even numbers, as 157 out of the total 265 have even numbers of both, and only five of these nuclei have odd numbers of both protons and neutrons. Even more specifically, there are certain magic numbers of nucleons that allow for a nucleus to be especially stable. So if a nucleus has a number of protons or neutrons equal to one of these magic numbers, it will be very stable, and even more so if both of them are present in magic numbers, which we would call double magic. So which nuclei are the most stable? Let's look at a chart that plots the binding energy per nucleon against the mass number. That means the average force holding together every particle inside a particular nucleus. We can see that the maximum binding energy occurs around 56 atomic mass units. This means that iron 56 is the most stable nucleus in the universe, as it has the maximum binding energy per nucleon, meaning that the greatest amount of energy is liberated when precisely this arrangement of nucleons fuses together to form an atomic nucleus. When a nuclide is unstable, some kind of radioactive decay may occur to make the nuclide more stable. So what are the particles involved in these nuclear reactions? Let's go through them one at a time. The first is the alpha particle. When this particle was discovered, we did not know what it was, so it was simply named alpha, but we later found out that it is a helium nucleus, so we can refer to it with either the alpha symbol or the helium symbol. This has a mass of four atomic mass units, so the mass number will be four, and since there are two protons, the atomic number will be two. Next is the beta particle. These are high energy electrons, and we can represent them with either an uppercase beta or an E for electrons. 
Note that the mass of the electron is negligible, so in the nuclide symbol, we put a zero for mass. However, we put a negative one for atomic number, because it will cancel out a positive charge from a proton. Next is the positron. This particle is an example of antimatter, which is a concept that is so strange and tangential to our purposes here that it's best to completely avoid rigorously describing antimatter. We just need to know that the positron is the antimatter version of the electron, so it has the same mass as the electron, but is opposite in charge. For this reason, we assign it either an e or an uppercase beta, just like the electron, but we will assign it a positive one for the atomic number, as it is positively charged. Next, we have the proton and the neutron. These should be very familiar, as they are the normal nucleons found in any atom. A proton can be referred to with either a lowercase p or a capital H, as a hydrogen nucleus is simply a proton. This will have atomic number one and mass number one. The neutron will be referred to with a lowercase n, and it will also have a mass number of 1, but its atomic number will be 0, as it has no charge. Lastly, there is the gamma ray. This is a particle of light, or electromagnetic radiation, known as a photon, just like the ones we saw emitted by electrons in the Bohr model, but these ones are of exceptionally high energy. This will be symbolized with a gamma, and two zeros, as light has no mass. And so these particles, the alpha particle, beta particle, positron, proton, neutron, and gamma particle are the ones that will be involved in the nuclear reactions we will be examining. Emission of any of these particles will happen for a very specific reason, so we will want to understand the cause of each in the context of a nuclear reaction. Perhaps the best way to understand these nuclear reactions is to learn how to balance them, so let's learn how to do that first. Take a look at this nuclear reaction. This says that polonium-212 becomes lead-208 when it emits an alpha particle. This is a valid nuclear reaction because it fulfills two important criteria. Number one, the mass numbers must add up to the same value on both sides of the equation. On the left, we have 212, and on the right, we have 208 plus 4, which equals 212. So the mass numbers are valid. Number two, the atomic numbers, which in a broader context we can think of as charges, given how we notate certain particles involved in these reactions, must add up to the same value on both sides of the equation. On the left we have 84, and on the right we have 82 plus 2, which equals 84, so the charges are also valid. This type of reaction will typically happen if the nuclide does not fit into the band of stability, often because the nucleus is simply too large to be stable, and the strong nuclear force dissipates more rapidly than the electromagnetic force, such that proton-proton repulsion starts to outweigh the force holding the nucleons together. Next, look at this reaction. This one says that when a nitrogen-14 is bombarded by an alpha particle, it produces oxygen-17 and a proton. Again, this is valid because the mass numbers add up to 18 on both sides, and the charges add up to 9 on both sides. Here we see that if beryllium-9 is bombarded by an alpha particle, we get carbon-12 and a neutron. Again, the mass numbers and charges check out. Additionally, looking at this reaction, we see that if a uranium-235 nucleus is bombarded by a single neutron, it will split up into a bromine-87 nucleus, a lanthanum-146 nucleus, and three other neutrons. Again, the masses and the charges are balanced. So remember that when writing nuclear reactions, we need both the mass numbers and charges to add up to the same value on both sides of the equation, just like these four examples. Let's try one example to make sure this makes sense. If magnesium-25 is bombarded by an alpha particle, it will produce a proton and some other nucleus X, with mass A and charge Z. What must this nucleus be, considering what we know about balancing nuclear reactions? Well, let's take a look at the mass numbers. On the left, we have 25 and 4, which add up to 29. That means that on the right, 1 and A must also add up to 29. That makes A equal to 28. Then for the charges, on the left we have 12 and 2, which add up to 14. That means that on the right, 1 and Z must also add up to 14. That makes Z equal to 13. If this nucleus has an atomic number of 13, then by definition it is an aluminum nucleus, and so with a mass of 28, this particle must be aluminum 28. So we've already begun to see some of the types of radioactive decay. 
Alpha decay, as we saw, will occur when a nucleus like this one, polonium-210, is simply too large. The strong nuclear force drops off much more quickly with distance than the electromagnetic force, so eventually the repulsion of the protons becomes too much for the strong nuclear force to hold it together, and an alpha particle will be ejected, resulting in a lighter nucleus. Next is beta decay. This is when a nucleus like iodine-131 emits an electron to become xenon-131. The reason this occurs is because a neutron is converted into a proton. This electron is not one of the electrons surrounding the nucleus. It is a completely different electron emitted during this transformation. This is a kind of decay that can occur if the neutron to proton ratio is too high, meaning too many neutrons and not enough protons. Changing one neutron into a proton will stabilize this kind of nucleus. Next will be positron emission, and we can see here oxygen-15 emitting a positron to become nitrogen-15. This is essentially the conversion of a proton into a neutron, and it will occur if the neutron-to-proton ratio is too low. The conversion of a proton into a neutron will help balance this ratio. Next, there is electron capture. Just the way emitting an electron changed a neutron into a proton, the capture or absorption of an electron will change a proton into a neutron. Again, this kind of decay will occur when the neutron to proton ratio is too low. Lastly, we have gamma emission. This will occur when a nucleus is in an excited state. It can decay to its ground state by emitting an extremely high energy gamma photon. Here, the asterisk means excited, and we can see that the cobalt nucleus on the right side is in the ground state. This is the only kind of nuclear reaction in which the parent nucleus does not change from one element to another. This chart summarizes the types of decay we just discussed. We can see that there are three main causes for nuclear decay. If the nucleus is too large, alpha decay might occur. If the neutron to proton ratio is either too large or too small, this can be adjusted by beta decay, positron emission, or electron capture. And if the nucleus is excited, it can reach the ground state through gamma emission. This must seem like a totally new concept, a reaction where an atom can change from one element to another. But these nuclear reactions are important to understand, so let's check out some applications of these next. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.